If I was doing this talk a couple of months ago, I would have described myself as a satirist and a travel writer. Unfortunately and sadly, I was arrested, jailed and deported by Homeland Security on my way to Chicago to write a travel book. So that put the kibosh on my travel writing career. Um, going to prison, in case you're wondering, is a fantastic way to kickstart a weight loss program. <laughs> and four days of not washing your hair really brings out its natural oils. So it leaves me with satire. But what is satire? Is it just taking the piss? Anyone can do that. And is it, like so many forms of media today, newspapers, magazines, television, radio, a dying art form? All questions that I hope to set us on the road to answering. Being able to make people laugh is lovely. It's a real privilege, but it's not one I appreciated as a teenager when I was laughed at a lot. I might just be standing there. I might be reading from Hamlet. Alas, poor York. People would just fall about. In the fifth form, I was in the high school musical, which was The Wizard of Oz. I stood on stage, and before I could even get to my first line, which, by the way, was meow, the entire audience just started laughing. I was bewildered. It took me years to figure out what was going on, that I am just hilarious as a concept to some people. <laughs> Added to which, I have a little-known medical condition called unintentional gormless face. My face, when resting, looks like a moron's. Things haven't been easy. Okay, but none of this goes towards explaining why I became a satirist. Satire isn't gurning. It's not a cartoon meme or a witty play on words. It's not making fun of someone because they're foreign or fat or a woman. It's not ex jokes at the expense of religion or race. That's being a bogan. <laughs> All right. First, a little history channel. Satire was invented by a beardy Greek hipster called Aristophanes. He was ripped off in turn by the Romans, who wrote rhyming poetry in the breaks in between orgies, a lot of which were very, very boring. The poems. The orgies were probably quite fun. <laughs> and that's the thing about satire. It doesn't date well. It's current and of the now. You literally have to be there. Fast forward to the Elizabethan age, and anyone who could pick up a quill was writing satire, mostly in the form of student magazine-style pamphlets. My lord has a poxy knob, sort of thing. This was a lot of fun, but put an end to by the Bishop of London in 1599 in the first example of literary censorship. A sad stream of stupid flowing downhill through time past Stalin and Hitler to now and the recent ban on Ted Dawes and the river. Luckily for Ted, the law of unintended consequences saw him sign an American book deal and movie rights. The Bishop of London died of gout. Our closest neighbours, the Australians, discovered satire in the early 19th century by having a mostly convict population. And we will get to see just how funny criminals can be when a lot of them are deported and sent here soon from Christmas Island. Satire took a long, long, long time to get to New Zealand. Not only are we a very great distance from everywhere else, but we were founded in the main, especially here in the South, by Scots Presbyterians who don't actually have a sense of humour. <laughs> it wasn't until the 1970s that we finally got the hang of it. Thanks to comedians like Billy T. James, New Zealanders learnt to lighten up and laugh at themselves. Unfortunately, by the end of the 1990s, we'd gotten a bit serious, and New Zealanders had become afraid to give offence. They wouldn't like to take the mickey anymore. We were afraid to mock and be mocked. Which brings us to now. We're online. People say whatever pops into their heads. And you genuinely wonder what will happen when humans get brave enough to say face to face the things they write in the comments section. Satirical outlets like The Civilian and The Onion get away with perverting the news of the day. But old forms of media, like television and radio, which might be a clue in itself, find that audiences are quick to jump on parody or anything that might upset, while at the same time, as a nation, we seem to love to be offended, ever poised above a sternly worded letter of complaint. I became a satirist in 2009 due to a combination of unemployment and an inability to be serious. <laughs> it's working out okay so far, except for the poverty and the jail time. <laughs> but what is satire? And do we even need it in a world where most of us would rather watch a video of a cat playing the piano than read a newspaper? 
If poetry can be summed up in tennis party terms by Oscar Wilde thus, I was working on a proof of my poems in the morning, he said, and I took out a comma. In the afternoon, I put it back in. <laughs> then satire is a cage fight. Jab, jab, uppercut. Max Eastman described satire as degrees of biting. If the world of literature was the world of dogs, then satire would be one of those surprisingly nasty little terriers that always go for children and postman's bottoms. And sometimes it does feel toothsome, dangerous even. Satire strips away the bullshit. It's a fire starter. Although with its ability to burn your own house down, its levels of appropriateness can be hard to judge. The satirists must temper their cynicism and vitriol with self-deprecation. They must own their own glass house before throwing a few stones. Sometimes it is too soon. Sometimes, as Pebbles Hooper found out, never is the only right time. And like villagers with torches and pitchforks, we love to punish those who get it wrong. Woe betide anyone who gets on the wrong side of the New Zealand Twitterati. Satire illuminates vices and follies, abuses and human shortcomings. It's always clever and never inadvertent. Kim Kardashian and Kanye West are a brilliant satire on celebrity culture. They just don't know it. Rich pickings can be found in the world of politics and politicians goaded to unseemly behaviour. The great Tom Scott satirical cartoons so infuriated then Prime Minister Robert Muldoon that he tried to have him thrown out of the parliamentary press gallery. Political satire can be as simple as a series of questions and answers. It can be as easy as a picture of the Prime Minister with a ponytail. It can be as sharp and complex as The Daily Show. Does it have an effect on the behaviour of politicians? Well, if shame can't do it, I don't think satire stands a chance. I don't write a lot of political satire, not because politicians are immune, but because in this country, it's such a gimme. When your Prime Minister goes to a cancer fundraiser and listens to a tearful story from a man who lost his wife to the disease and then stands up and gives a speech about a flag, that's not an occasion for satire, it's just desperately sad. I prefer the middle classes, those who cry poverty when the box their new refrigerator came in could house an entire family of Syrian refugees. And they can take it for the most part, but not always. Reader feedback is a mixed bag. It's a post bag, usually. People seem reluctant to say what they think to my face, but happy to draw on it. <laughs> At one end of the feedback continuum, a box of chocolates. At the other end, a drawing of a penis in red crayon. <laughs> it was hard to know if this was positive or negative feedback. It was medium-sized feedback. <laughs> I've had notes in the letterbox telling me to move out. I've been called a little bitch, a fat shamer, smug and entitled. But before you think this is sexism, a lot of this comes from other women. Attracting rants and weirdos, though, is a sign of satire's success. If its message ruffles, if it makes people angry, if the reader, while laughing, thinks, yes, that is completely douchey behaviour, or becomes incensed and takes it personally because they are a douchebag, then it has done its job. <laughs> satire is a break on society. Its function is to pull us up as we rush headlong, to hold a mirror up to naked emperors, to say, hey, you with the yacht, you've got no pants on. <laughs> but this only has an effect if society is paying attention. When you have a high level of blissful ignorance in a population, when wisdom is found in cobbled together aphorisms that resemble sports shoe slogans, then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> I think personally, it is no surprise and no coincidence that the last real flourishing of really truly acerbic satire in this country was also the last true hurrah of public protest. The Springbok tour, abortion law reform, gay rights, nuclear testing. It was the last time we saw people on the streets and visibly angry before we started sniping each other from behind our inboxes. With everything changing and all the old certainties dying, and they should, humans have always benefited from creative destruction. Is satire dead? Did it catch redundancy along with public protest? Well, satire is not dead, but it's lost a lot of weight recently and picked up a nasty cough. Things don't look good for satire. Only you can decide whether it's time to have Do Not Resuscitate tattooed across its chest. Read, read, read against the dying of the mind. 
think seriously about the source material that shapes your opinions and whether you will swallow every soothing spoonful of media pap or choose a more acquired taste. The future of We Sarcastic View is in your hands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.